Well, let me just give you a very warm welcome to our morning service and our family service. We're delighted to see you all, both upstairs and down, and we warmly welcome every single person in the Saviour's precious name. It's that time of the year when folks are uh, getting off work, looking forward to the holiday season, and many, I'm sure, have been working hard, and they're probably feeling a bit flat, and they're feeling that... uh, They would need about a year off, never mind a week. And I know it's a time of the year you get weary and you get tired. And uh, I know that work has just uh, overwhelmed so many people. And uh, some only got off on Friday. And uh, some were doing late shopping, no doubt, yesterday. And uh, I'm sure the stress of the season is felt as well. But we trust the Lord will bless you over the holiday season. We mean that in your family times and uh, wherever you are and wherever you go. We trust the Lord will richly bless you. And may today be uh, a Lord's Day you will remember. Uh, That will not just be Christmas Eve, but the Lord's Day. A real blessing to your soul. And God's word would be precious to your heart. And the Lord would encourage you and your family. Also to those that are tuning in on the live stream, we warmly welcome you. And we trust the Lord will bless and encourage your heart. We're going to turn to the hymn number 76. I know I'm sure you've sung this a few times already. Uh, this past few weeks, but we want to sing heartily. We don't want familiarity to breed any contempt with us for these hymns, one of Charles Wesley's great hymns, uh, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. I want you to think about the words, uh, their beautiful words, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconcile. Number 76, and we're going to stand together. I think we've got the projector fixed, so... Yep, the words are starting to come up on screen, and my outline for the, for my, uh, my messages will also appear, maybe not this morning, but probably tonight, so from now on, because folks have been asking about it, they like to see it up on screen and they can follow it, so uh, we do appreciate that. But if you want still to use the hymn book, feel free, but the words will come up on the screen. Number 76. <clears throat>
Amen. You may take your seat and get your breath back again for the next hymn. Uh, some of these uh, Christmas hymns can be very hard to sing. That's one of them, but it's one of Charles Wesley's great hymns. Uh, the amazing thing about Charles Wesley is uh, that he was not only a Methodist, but in many ways he declared himself to be Arminian. Uh, that is a doctrine that we feel is contrary to Scripture. And yet whenever you read the theology of his hymns, he, he writes hymns uh, like literally a Calvinist, a one who believes in the electing purpose of God, one who believes the Lord not only saves the sinner, but he keeps the sinner. And Wesley's hymns are fantastic. Some of the greatest hymns uh, that the church has ever been singing uh, were written by Charles Wesley, a tremendous gifted hymn writer. And uh, no doubt uh, we have been blessed through many of his hymns, and this is one of them. We only sing it this time of the year, and if we were to sing this during the month maybe of June, people would think they were a bit off. But I will tell you this, Easter has already been advertised in the shops, by the way. My wife and I were out yesterday, went into a garage and into a shop, and there it was. It says, celebrate Easter, Cadbury's, I think it's Cadbury's mini eggs. So they're out and all. So the Easter eggs will be out on Boxing Day, and you can start your Easter shopping, no doubt. But that's the way retail is. It, it never misses a, an opportunity to advertise, the power of advertising. I was thinking of Easter eggs already before I've even opened my selection box. Uh, but we'll just bow briefly in prayer, and we'll seek the Lord together. Loving Father, it is with joy and thanksgiving that we come before Thee. We come to worship. Lord, we know that uh, those angels came, and so did the shepherds and the wise men, and they came with their gifts and their offerings. They came with praise. They came to behold the Son of God, the Christ child laid in the manger, virgin born. They came, and there was a heavenly host. And Lord, the very angels of heaven sang at his birth. We think of the, the songs that are recorded about the birth of Christ. We think of how Mary sung about the Saviour. We think of how Zacharias sung about the Saviour. We think of how Elizabeth sung about the Saviour. We think of how Simeon and how Anna and all sang about the birth of the Christ child. And we rejoice, O God, in the knowledge that when Christ comes on the scene, he puts a song in our heart. The world, Lord, is joyless if we're truthful. Lord, it doesn't have a song. It doesn't have a reason to sing today. Lord, there are many who have participated in sin last night. And Lord, they've woken up this morning, even if they're even up yet. And Lord, their heads are, Lord, splitting. Their, Lord, their body is aching. And Lord, the terrors of sin and the horrors, Lord, of a wasted life are upon them. Lord, the, there is no joy in the world. We know that. Some of us have been there and tasted, and we know that there is no lasting pleasure. There's but pleasure for a little season, and that's all. But we thank thee that Christ brings satisfaction. Christ and his birth into this world has brought good news and good cheer and joy to the world. We think of that hymn we often sing at the Christmas season, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. And Lord, we praise thee, we bless thee uh, that we have received Christ as our king and we have been born of his spirit, washed in his blood and we have the song of the soul set free. And Lord, we know that our tune is joyful because our theme is is Jesus. And we have a right to shout and sing. We praise thee, Lord, that we can rejoice in the Lord. We think of Nehemiah and how he said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And Lord, we have to say this. We don't rejoice in thee the way we should. Lord, we may even need to have to be taught how to live rejoicing in God's full and free salvation. We think, Lord, of those letters that we received many, many years ago when we were incarcerated and how believers signed off. Uh, we trust you're living, rejoicing in God's salvation. And those things have never left us. Lord, we have sought as best we can to live rejoicing in what Christ means to us and what he has done for us. And we pray even if we don't feel like giving him the glory today, that you will change that. Even if we feel, Lord, down in the dumps, if we feel weary in our mind, tired in our body, hardly could lift our Bible or even understand what we're reading, hardly, Lord, 
string a few words together to praise thee. And if we did, we feel we're hypocrites because there's no heart behind it. Lord, help us today uh, to focus our attention upon the Savior. Lord, the world at large were in, Lord, they were in ignorance at the birth of Christ. Only a few came to see the birth of heaven's King. Lord, we recognize but a few gathered in that old stable in Bethlehem. And a few, Lord, of people on the earth came. Lord, only a few from royalty came with their gifts to Christ. And then the heavenly host, how heaven was stirred. And the angels began to sing at the birth of Christ. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. We thank thee, Father, that the light of the world has come. We praise thee that the hope of the nations has come. We rejoice that the Son of God has risen with healing in his wings. And we bless thee, Lord, that he is the Savior of the world. He is, O God, the Redeemer of God's elect. And we bless thee for many in this meeting house and those tuning in online and elsewhere, even outside, many outside our own denomination, know and love the Savior. We bless thee for the body of Christ. We thank thee for the church. And Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And when he came into this world, that little child born in Bethlehem, Lord, bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh, was God manifest in our humanity, all for the suffering of death on the cross, that he might take our place, that he might die in our guilty room instead, that he might, Lord, save us from our sins. And Lord, we thank thee for the name that was given to him at his birth. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall save his people from their sins. And we bless thee for the design of the gospel. Who would have thought it up? That God would be, Lord, come into this world. He would intervene in history by a virgin birth. Who would have believed it? Lord, it was prophesied in Isaiah and yet not believed by the Jews. And the world did not anticipate what God would do to save our souls. Lord, how enormous and great sin must be when it took thee, God Almighty, to come into this world to deal with it. No, Lord, human being, no scheme of man, no program of government, no, Lord, right or ritual of the church, Lord, could ever save our guilty souls. But God manifest in the flesh. It had to be, Lord, that Christ must become a man. God himself must be veiled in humanity in order to save sinful fallen men and women. And we lift our hearts. Who would have thought that? There's the wisdom of God before us. How wise is our God? how just and true that you can be the justifier you can pardon the guilty and yet still at the same time be just punish sin and it only could happen when Christ became a man by virgin birth how important it is for us to uphold the doctrine of the virgin born saviour and we bless thee father he was not and never could be tainted or even tempted to sin. He is without sin, and you preserved the humanity of Christ when he was virgin born. And yet, Lord, we thank thee and we bless thee that on the cruel cross of Calvary, deity upholding his humanity, he suffered as the second Adam, that he might put away our sin and save our precious never-dying souls. And we are indebted to God for a risen Savior, for a coming King, for a salvation full and free. May we live rejoicing and what Christ means to us, and what the Lord hath done for our souls. Bless this congregation today. We thank thee for the past year, and we bless thee, Lord, for being with us. Some, Lord, have passed through times of ill health, and you've answered prayer. And at the end of this year, there's been a, a measure of answered prayer, and we just lift our hearts in thanksgiving. What can we say? More than we have said. Lord, how much more thankful can we be Lord, just to acknowledge, Lord, we are sincere, we truly mean it. We're grateful to God and we acknowledge thee and thank thee. Some have been helped through, Lord, sorrow and some have passed through bereavement. And Lord, we pray for them. Some still have a heavy heart and we ask for thy mercy and grace for them. That some, Lord, carry heavy burdens today. Some sitting in this house, listening online, sitting in meeting houses, some maybe even struggling even to get out to church. Some may even not have made it because they're overwhelmed with problems and difficulties and worries and fears and anxieties. And Lord, we recognize we, we all go through our own trials. Each one of us have a cross to bear. Lord, behind a nicely, Lord, dressed individual. Now, there could be, O oh God, behind that smiling face today, an aching heart, 
a sorrowful soul, a troubled heart. Lord, someone who is in deep anguish, someone who needs help from God, someone who needs mercy, someone who needs thy touch today. Lord, we don't know the need. Who are we? Lord, we wouldn't even know our own heart's need, but we can bring everyone to thee. We pray for the families of this house. We pray for the sick and sorrowing, the aged and the infirmed. Pray for the young and the old alike. We pray, Lord, for thy hand upon them. We pray, Lord, you'll step into every situation. Lord, give help. There's not a man or a woman, saved or unsaved, that doesn't need help from thee. Lord, we, if we say we don't, then we're too proud. Lord, we pray we might humble our hearts, recognize that our help cometh from the Lord. So give us help today. Lord, remember the congregation. Bless richly the word preached and the worship of thy saints. And across our land, inside and outside the denomination, bless all who are faithful to the blood and book. You know those that we have prayed for today. You know those pastors and ministers that are struggling, coming to the end of the year and Maybe even some feel like throwing the towel in. Some feel like giving up, and it's true, even among thy servants. We pray, Lord, you will encourage them at the end of the year, and you'll strengthen them for a new year, and you'll build them up, and you'll bless the work, and you'll answer prayer, save the lost, restore the backslider, revive the church, and, Father, be with us now. Take of our thanks and glorify thy dear Son today in Jesus' precious and worthy name. Amen. Number 80 this time, number 80. We'll sing the first two and the last two verses. That's verses 1 and 2 and verses 5 and 6. Once in Royal David City stood a lowly cattle shed. Number 80, verses 1 and 2 and then 5 and 6. Let's all stand as we sing. I invite you to turn in your Bible, please, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. Each Gospel, as you know, uh, sometimes records events that other Gospels do not record, and that has led to some folks saying that because Matthew, Mark, and John didn't record this, then Luke did and the rest didn't. Why would they leave it out? And it has led some what they're called higher critics of the Old and New Testament, 
uh, to say that the Bible's not inspired and why do not all the writers? Well, uh, you'd have to understand that there are some of those writers who were inspired to emphasize a certain part of the ministry of Christ. John concludes, I believe, summar summarizing exactly what I would say to you. And he says, if literally if all the books in the world could not contain uh, the things about Christ, who he is, what he did, that you couldn't write volumes, so they had to be selective. Uh, but Luke's gospel is unique in many ways because it does record quite a number of events that are not found in Matthew, Mark, and in John's gospel. And they're, they're exclusive to the gospel uh, that Luke has written. And one of these uh, is uh, the songs that accompanied the birth of Christ. And uh, there are at least six songs written and sung whenever Christ came into this world. And this is one of them. We're breaking in at the chapter 2 at the verse 25. Luke chapter 2, verse 25. Let us all hear and read together the precious word of God. Luke 2, verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold this child, is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, and the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Amen. We lend our reading there at the verse 35. We know the Lord will indeed bless the public reading of his own precious and infallible word. To ask our clerk of session, Mr. Alistair, if he'll come forward, please. He's going to make some necessary announcements. Thank you. Well, a warm word of welcome, <clears throat> pardon me, a warm word of welcome to you all uh, once again out to the Lord's house this morning. Good to see you all, and we do pray that the Lord will bless us in his presence today. Uh, do remember, of course, that in this evening we have that change in time. Our service is brought forward by an hour, uh, and we'll meet at 6 p.m. this evening rather than 7 uh, for that special carol service that has been uh, organized, and of course, uh, much of uh, the homegrown talent yeah. are going to be involved uh, in that this evening. Just for the choir to remind you uh, that you are invited to come a bit early. Uh, hopefully, if you could meet about 5 p.m. for a final practice uh, before the service this evening. And of course, remember as well that after that, uh, there will be a light supper served over in the church hall. The meetings uh, during the week, of course, the uh, youth and things like that uh, are on the break at the moment. So Wednesday evening, instead of Tuesday, uh, meeting on Wednesday evening for our prayer meeting. And that's what it will be. It'll just be a season of prayer. Uh, uh, no uh, ministry on uh, Wednesday evening. And it will run from about 8 to 9 p.m. So if you can make it out for that, uh, then we would encourage you to do so. Uh, Friday at 10 p.m., the men's prayer meeting will go ahead as usual. Uh, remember the meetings next Lord's Day then. It'll be the last day of the year. 
uh, and we were meeting at 11.30 in the morning and at 7 p.m. in the evening. Uh, the evening service uh, will be uh, the final, We're having a series of evening services where people uh, come along and give a personal word of testimony. Uh, this will be the final one for this year, and her sister, Miss Hazel McElroy, will be bringing a word of testimony next Lord's Day evening. And then, of course, after that, uh, you get a break after that service, but uh, if you can, uh, our watch night service will be taking place uh, to meet in the Lord's house and see in the new year, uh, meeting at quarter past ten, starting with a cup of tea, and then the service proper uh, starting at 11 p.m. Uh, next Lord's Day evening uh, for the watch night service. Uh, can I just mention again, I mentioned last week, uh, the free will offering envelopes for next year, they are there. I didn't go into any great detail last year, but uh, if you are uh, interested, uh, I know people are familiar with the system and no doubt will uh, be getting their envelopes and so on, uh, but if there are those who haven't been using the free will offering uh, system and you'd like to do that, uh, then uh, it's free for you to just take a pack of envelopes. You don't need to register the number with anybody. Nobody needs to know uh, unless you uh, want to give on to the gift aid scheme, which is uh, something different. We would sort you out in regard to that. Uh, but you can take your envelopes and then at the end of the year, of course, we, against each number, uh, we do uh, publish the amount that has come in during the year so you can see what your annual giving was. So do feel free, if you would like to, uh, to pick up a pack of envelopes from the porch, porch as you leave. Thank you. Well, we do thank our Clerk of Session for making those announcements, as always subject to the divine will of the Lord. Before we come to the preaching of God's Word, we'll turn to the hymn number 82. We'll stand again as we sing, and as we are now having our practice, once we hear the first note, we'll rise, and then we'll be ready for uh, the main key to start the singing. Number 82, please. <laughs> Well, let's turn again in our Bibles to Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. And with the Word of God open before us, we'll 
ask help from the Lord to illuminate the page and speak to our hearts and give us help in the preaching and hearing of God's holy word. Loving Father, (coughs) it is with thanksgiving that we can open our English Bible. We heard on Tuesday evening, Lord, the importance of the translation of the word of God into the the language of the nations. And we thank thee, Lord, for many, many years ago uh, when the Bible was translated into the English language. We bless thee, Lord, and praise thee for giving to us a copy of thy holy word in our mother tongue. And we thank thee for our English Bible. We bless thee for the word of God. These are the oracles of God. This is the word of the living God. We're not handling a history book. We're not handling a book, Lord, of poetry. We're not handling, Lord, a song book. We realize, Lord, we're not handling an encyclopedia. We realize, Lord, that this is nothing else but the scriptures of truth. This is the word of the Lord. And Lord, we thank thee for the inspired and the inerrant and infallible word of God. We thank thee for this gift to the English-speaking world. We bless thee, Lord, for our authorized version of Holy Scripture. We believe it's the only pure translation in the English language. We believe that with all our hearts. We don't believe, Lord, that the modern versions come up anywhere to scratch. We realize that. We recognize, O God, that you have gifted to us. And that's why we hold fast to our authorized version. We thank thee, Lord, for its translation from the original autographs. We bless thee, Lord, for those 40 Westminster divines who give themselves to prayer in the study of the Hebrew and Greek languages in order to translate as best they could into our mother tongue, our English Bible. We thank thee for those who, like Tyndale and Wycliffe and many others, who gave their lives in, Lord, and sacrificed their time to give to us, Lord, a copy of the English Bible. And we pray that we will never treat it, Lord, as just an ordinary book. May we never throw it down on the floor. don't believe, Lord, we should even set anything upon it. We pray, Lord, that we might recognize that it is a holy Bible. Lord, the ungodly, the false religions of this world treat their so-called holy books better than some treat their Bibles. Scribbled over, pages ripped, thrown down, cast into the boot of the car. We pray, Lord, we might recognize the importance and, Lord, the preciousness of the Word of God. And, Lord, this is thy Word. And as we come to read it and preach upon it and hear it, We pray there'll be a stillness and a solemnity and the fear of God will settle upon our minds and our hearts and we might hear the word of the Lord with joy. We pray we might come before thee with fear and trembling, knowing that God is speaking to us from his word. Speak to hearts today. Speak to me. Cleanse us afresh in the blood. Fill us now with thy Holy Spirit and give to me thy servant, Lord, the infilling of the Spirit. I thank thee, Lord, for this year when you've been with me in the pulpit in the study, in the private place with thee. Thank thee, Lord, for giving help in the public place, for each infilling of the Holy Ghost, for the help that I have received as thy servant, as a preacher. I pray, Lord, you will strengthen me for these last two Sundays of an old year and bring us into a new with renewed vision and vigor and vitality and great victory. To this end, Almighty God, I ask thee once again, in the presence of this congregation and before heaven, for the infilling of the Spirit of the living God. I pray, Lord, that I will become an object of the endowment of power from on high, that I might know heaven's anointing and that empowerment to preach the word of God and to rightly divide the word of truth. To this end, Father, cleanse thy temple, wash my heart from sin, cleanse my heart and hands, make me clean and pure within, and the vessel cleansed by precious blood, put in and upon thy Holy Spirit, Give to me the anointing oil of the Holy Ghost. And on this, the Lord's day for the preaching of Christ, I pray for the filling of the Spirit with wisdom and power. Bless that word to every soul. Save the lost. Restore the backslidden. Revive the church. Glorify thy dear Son and the people of God said, Amen. You know, there are six songs that are associated with the incarnation or the virgin birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, All of those six songs, by the way, are recorded in Luke's gospel. Luke is the only one of the four gospels to actually record 
uh, word for word, those six songs that accompanied uh, the news of Christ's birth and his coming into this world. The birth of the Savior, the birth of the Christ child, the birth of the, the Son of the living God, the birth of God incarnate. Uh, that birth was met by rejoicing. That birth was met by singing. And I know there are some people and they love to sing. They're individuals and they love to sing. The whirling loves to sing. And when they go into the pubs and clubs, they love to have the music on. They love to sing. Even in the workplace, it doesn't seem that people can work in silence. They need the radio on or they need a CD constantly playing in the shops and in the stores. Worldly music, pop music or Christmas theme music at this time of the year. And it does seem that people in this world, human beings love to sing. We often talk about God's creation. You wake up in the morning if you're up early enough and uh, you're up before the squeak of dawn, uh, you will hear uh, the dawn chorus, as they call it. And the birds begin to chirp and they begin to sing. And there's not a single noise, but the birds singing. You don't hear it as much in the towns as you do in the countryside uh, with the volume of traffic and the noise and so on. But you will hear the dawn chorus, the very birds themselves, God's creation is singing. God has put a song into the earth. Now we know that sin has soured that song. Sin sadly has corrupted that song. And people just sing about themselves now. They sing about me. They sing about my problems, my troubles, what I am, what I hope to be. And it's all about me. But ultimately God's song in creation, God's song whenever Christ came to be the saviour of the world, is all about Christ. It's all about God. And it's a good thing to sing. A really good thing to sing. And I trust that you will be a singing Christian. And I mean that. Joyful. I remember being recently in a certain place and this person passed by me and they were singing into themselves. They were singing into themselves. You could hear but a few words and you knew there was a melody there. And as they passed by, they were singing. And I felt like stopping them and saying, you're a happy person. What's made you glad? You just don't hear people sing. Or maybe you'd say, well, if you knew the people that I meet with and work with, if they sung, you wouldn't want to hear them singing. But it just means they're happy. There are very few people that are unhappy ever sing. I don't believe for a moment that you've met someone who's depressed, down in the dumps, and they're singing. You meet someone who's happy, content, and joyful. That's why the Christian should be singing. The Lord has given us the song of the soul set free. Uh, and one person said, and I like always to quote it, I did just, just there a few moments ago in prayer, uh, that we have a song and we can sing because our, our tune is joyful, because our theme is Jesus. And the hymn writer got it right when he penned that the children of the Lord have a right to shout and sing. So I have a right to shout, by the way, in the pulpit, and you have a right to sing. The children of the Lord have a right to shout and sing. For the way is growing bright. Our souls are on the wing. It shouldn't take Christmas to make you happy. It shouldn't take the fact of anticipating a nice secret present. Something you feel you would like. And you feel your husband or your wife has got it for you. And it's under the tree. I hope you're not disappointed by the way. I hope you get what you want for Christmas. And I'm sure you will. And, uh, and no doubt you will. But it shouldn't take a birthday. It shouldn't take a family outing or a family get-together. It should not take the fact that you're going on a holiday to a sunny climate and escaping the winter uh, cold here to make you happy. It shouldn't take something in work or a pay rise or promotion to make you happy. You, no matter what state you're in, you and I should learn Christian contentment, to rejoice in the Lord, to rejoice and be glad, and to sing unto him. And at the birth of Christ, there are six songs associated with the birth of Christ. John G. Butler, in commentating on the birth of Christ in his series on the life of Christ, and I recommend if you can purchase that or even get it online and, and read through those commentaries on the birth of Christ, literally his birth to his resurrection or even to his second coming. John G. Butler, commentating on the birth of Christ, said this, I quote, When Christ comes on the scene, he puts a song in our hearts, unquote. And no doubt David himself, David himself penned the words and rejoiced in the very thought. He hath put a new song 
in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. He hath put a new song. So, child of God, the Lord has given you a new song. The world cannot sing that song. It's the song of the soul set free. It's the harmony and the melody of heaven itself. It's the joy of sins forgiven, peace with God. And it's not only a happy feeling, but it literally expresses itself in song, in worship of God. And there's no better thing for the soul than to sing unto the Lord. And I know there are times whenever we don't feel like giving him the glory. There's a hymn that we sing, and it goes like this, for I feel like giving him the glory. And you know, I don't like that sentiment, but I will sing it. But I understand it. I feel. So there are days when you don't feel, and it doesn't matter. No, you just don't give him the glory because you feel like giving him the glory. You give him the glory no matter how you feel. And I tell you this, a remedy for your sorrow and your sadness or your heaviness would be to sing today. At the birth of Christ, surely you've got something to sing about. He came into the world. He was virgin born. God was manifest in flesh. And he came to save you. He came because he loved you. He came to pardon your sin. To pay the price for your sin. He came to deliver you from sin, death, and eternal hell. He came to redeem you from the curse of the law. He came to give you eternal life. He came to give you a home in heaven. He came to suffer and bleed, and die, and rise again, because he loved you. And surely you can sing about that today. Surely you can set aside the sorrow, and the care, and the anxiety, and any worry that you have. Surely you can unburden to the Lord, and begin to sing today. Why don't you try that? I remember reading a little booklet, and as a little booklet came in, whenever I was incarcerated, and I remember lying there, depressed as a believer, and there was a little book came in, a little booklet, and I'm sure... It's probably out of print now. I don't even know if you could ever get it. The only place you'll probably find it where everything else in the world is, is a lady, lady's handbag. That's a fact. I remember saying about a gospel tract. And I says, that tract, you'd never get it today. And at the door, a woman met me at the door and she says, I have that in my handbag. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It's called a diamond lost overboard. She had the actual tract in her handbag. And I said to her, I says, you know, it's true. There's everything in a woman's handbag. But I'll tell you this, the little booklet was called Try Praise. That's what it was called. The little booklet was called Try Praise. And it really was saying that whenever you're down and you're discouraged, you should sing unto the Lord. Give your reasons to sing, reasons to praise, reasons that you knew, but you're forgotten because you're overwhelmed. And at this time of the year, I don't want you to sing the world song. I don't want you to sing the song of the pervert. And that's what he was. Let's hit number one. I want you to sing the Lord's song. I want you to rejoice in the birth of Christ. I want you to sit down with your family. And why can you not just sit? And just open the Bible on Christmas Day or even today. And just read the Christmas story to your children or your young people. And then as a family, just lift the hymn book. And take one of the Christmas themes or even a gospel-themed hymn, any hymn, and just lift your soul. And maybe in your own bedroom, just as you're there, lift your phone and maybe get on a song and sing that unto the Lord and lift your heart today. I'm convinced the reason why these songs are associated with the birth of Christ is because it lifts the heart. It brings joy. It carries a message. It ministers to us. I want to tell you, when, and it is, and I know it does say try praise, and even the title slightly misleading. When all else has failed, try this. But it really was emphasizing, it was an unfortunate title for the book, I understand. But it was emphasizing the importance of singing unto the Lord. I wonder, when was the last time you were happy? When were you the last, the last time that you began to sing? Doing the dishes, washing the car going out to work, going out to different places, just in the, in the home, just doing your own work, just lying in your own bedroom, sitting in your lounge, just lifting the heart and singing to the Lord. I want to tell you something. Christ makes your heart glad, doesn't he? 
Christ rejoices your soul, doesn't he? Christ puts a song in your soul, the song of the soul set free. And therefore Christ gives joy to our hearts. And if we know the Lord and we love the Lord and we're saved by grace, washed in the blood, and we've repented of our sin and accepted God's free gift of salvation, then we can sing today the Lord's song. You remember what was said of the children of Israel in Babylon? It was said that they couldn't sing the Lord's song in a strange land. And it may be that you haven't sung for a long time because you are in a strange land. You're not where you should be with the Lord and you've lost your joy. Did you know that the sweet psalmist of Israel who has given us that uh, hymn book in the book of Psalms, David for 11 months was joyless. He was a joyless Christian. Did you know that? Whenever he sinned with Bathsheba, Whenever he had Uriah, her husband, killed on the battlefield, whenever word reached him during those 11 months that Bathsheba now was with child and he had to kill her husband in order to try or send her husband to, as if he would be the one that was responsible for the birth of this child and nobody would know and then eventually had to kill the husband and so on and so on. I want to tell you something. David was joyless. He didn't write any psalms during that time. He had nothing to sing about. The only two psalms he had written after he was confronted by Nathan the prophet was Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. And they were songs of repentance and return to the Lord for a backslider. But the joy of the Lord was missing. He lost his, we often speak about Samson, the strong man who lost his strength. But what about David, the sweet psalmist that lost his song? And for 11 months he was joyless. Have you ever met a joyless Christian? A Christian who has no joy, no happiness, no peace, no contentment. And they're just miserable because of sin. I want to tell you the birth of Christ gives you now, today, a reason to put that right. Get right with God. Have your sins pardoned and washed. And then you can sing again the Lord's song. And you don't have to be in Babylon. And hang your harps upon the willows. The hymn writer penned these beautiful words. I have something in my heart that Jesus gave to me. It makes me feel like singing glory all the day. He found my captive soul and gave me liberty. And now I feel like singing glory. Why? Because he makes the path grow brighter every passing day. He makes the burden lighter all along the way. His word is my delight. His will I now obey, and all the time I'm singing glory. I want to tell you something. You think the preacher and the pastor doesn't have a heavy heart. You think that I don't get tired and weary and discouraged. Do you think that? You think that I live in cloud cuckoo land, or I'm sitting on a wee harp all week, just strumming away, enjoying the Lord. I'm not without my temptations, my failures, my own backslidings, my coldness of heart. I'm not without losing my own joy. But I want to tell you something, tired as I am, weary as I am, nevertheless, I've rejoiced in the Lord. I've been glad in his salvation and it's lifted my soul. It may not solve my problems, but it makes my heart glad, gives me peace in the midst of a storm, gives me contentment in a world that's dissatisfied, gives me joy in a world that has no peace. Well, it's not possible, I know, for us today to look at all six songs. I just want to summarize the song of Simeon. In fact, it's the last of the six songs. The song of Simeon. This individual who really lifts his heart in praise and adoration of God. I want to think, because the song really characterized his life. What he was really singing was his testimony. He was singing his testimony. He was praising God. And at the same time, he reveals in his song the characteristics of an individual who's living in the light of the first coming of Christ. And therefore, he's a pattern in his song for those who are living in the light of the second coming of Christ. And he has something to teach us today. If he was here, he would sing his song to you. Do you know, I have sung his song on many occasions. Did you know that? I have personally sung the song of Simeon on many occasions. Now, only those who have been brought up in the Church of Ireland would understand what I'm saying. Because Simeon's song is called what is known as the Nuc de Minus. That's what it's called. The Nuc de Minus. Lord, 
Now let us thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the hope and the glory of thy people Israel. And it's called the Nook de Minas. And I have sung it as a young person in the choir, embarrassingly with my robes on, walking up and down the aisle, standing with all the young ones and older ones, singing the Nook de Minas, the song of Simeon, and had no clue what it meant, because I wasn't saved. But today I can sing that song today in its true context and rejoice. I want to tell you in this song we see a man whose life is characterized by purity. That's what we see. A man who's anticipating the coming of Christ and his life is characterized by purity. Look what it says in verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon and the same man was just and devout. And if you wanted to summarize those two words, just and devout, here's a man who's living in the light of the first coming of Christ. And here is a characteristic of his life. He is holy. He's just. And he's devout. He's honest. Two characteristics today that should be found in the believer. Holy and honest. Two characteristics that should be found in this preacher every day of my life. Holy and honest. Just and devout. Worshipper of God. Simeon along with Mary, Joseph, Zacharias, Elizabeth, and Anna. All six songs sung by these individuals. Simeon, Mary, Joseph himself, Zacharias, who was the father of John the Baptist, Elizabeth, who was the mother of John the Baptist, and Anna, who was an aged widow in the temple, who never left the temple and worshipped God day and night with fastings and prayers, proved that there, was, that there were godly, faithful individuals in Israel, despite the great apostasy prior to the first coming of Christ. You see, some of the events to, leading up to the first coming of Christ are really mirror. They're mirror images of what will happen at the second coming. And I want to tell you, if you study the events of the first coming of Christ, you will find that those characteristics in the world are found prior to the second coming of Christ. And therefore, at the coming of the Lord, there will be on earth faithful, just, holy, honest, devout men and women. And I want to be among that giddy throng. I want to be amongst those that are faithful to the Lord when he returns the second time. I want to be a modern day Simeon and you would want to be a modern day Anna. You would be, want to be like Zacharias. You would want to be like Joseph who sang. You would want to be like Mary who sang. You certainly would want to be like Simeon. I believe that religion and the first coming of Christ was at an all-time low. The nation of Israel had literally a downgrade into apostasy. It was a corrupt religion. So the Lord had to chase them out of the temple. They'd made the temple a den of thieves, he said. And when the Lord came the first time, such was the religious apostasy. Did you know that? That Herod the Great, and he gave that title to himself. There was nothing great about Herod. Herod the Great, that's not the Herod, by the way. That's not the Herod that Christ was sent to. It was Herod Antipas. But Herod the Great was the Herod that put all the children to death in Bethlehem. According to the prophecy of Jeremiah, Rachel would be weeping for her children. But Herod the Great, there are about three or four Herods in the Bible, two in particular, and in history there are at least four. But the one that put John the Baptist to death was not Herod the Great. Herod the Great put all the children to death. And I want to tell you this, that Herod, during his time leading that nation, he corrupted the priesthood. He chose the high priest. Did you know that? Herod the Great chose the high priest. And he put a man in place that wouldn't, that wouldn't highlight his sin. A high priest that would do his bidding. And he corrupted the high priest and the priestly office in Israel. And therefore when Christ came, when Christ came into the world, when he was born, there was a despot who made himself king over Judea. Herod the Tetrarch. In other words, it was just a quarter. He ruled over a quarter of the part of Israel. That's all. 
And he was a governor, and he made himself King Herod the Great. And he called himself Great. There was nothing great about him. But I'll tell you this. He corrupted the priesthood. And the priesthood, religiously and politically, was run by the Romans. And therefore, it wasn't following the law of God. And when Christ was born, I want to tell you, very few Jews rejoiced in the birth. Such was the oppression of Roman enemy that they were more concentrated on getting the enemy out of the land than welcoming the Messiah to the land. And when Christ was born, and those who embraced him at the start, they believed that he would rise up as a king in David's stead, and he would literally, the Jews believed this in the Lord's day. In fact, the Jews believe it still today. They believe that when Messiah comes, he will drive out the Roman enemy, and the Jews will rule the world. Jews believe that today. When their Messiah comes, they, along with him, will rule the world. And the nations will fall at their feet. But they're wrong. Christ rules the world now. Christ is the saviour of the world now. And his kingdom was not of this world. His is a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of those who repent and believe. And he was never setting up a throne in Israel. He was never setting up a kingdom in Israel. He was never coming with a sword, but with the gospel of peace, that men and women might be saved. And therefore, they had nothing to sing about. Even when Christ manifested himself with his miracles, many followed him, and then they rejected him because they thought he would sit as king on the throne of David. He thought he would lead a rebellion against the Romans. He thought that this Messiah would now come and destroy their enemy, and the Jews would conquer the world. And when Christ says, my kingdom is not of this world, they couldn't understand it. Therefore, they rejected their Messiah, even to this day. You know, morals were at a loose end, all but gone. How easy it was to take a woman in adultery. Did you know that? Do you remember the time the Lord was preaching and the religious leaders took this woman? And she says, this woman's taken in adultery. And the law of Moses says, you must stone her. Now, what are you going to do? How could they just pick up a woman in adultery? like that because morals were at really an all-time low and I would suggest to you that the reason why every person walked away when the Lord says whoever's without sin I, I'm near sure and I'm only speculating I'm near sure the Lord was saying whoever is without sin with this woman let him cast the first stone I would say most of those religious leaders had been with that woman and she was left alone, and he says, Where are thine accusers? Where, where have they gone? He says, There are none, Master. And he says, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And I'd love to know what he wrote on the ground, for it says he continued writing. He wrote on the ground. Maybe he did write one of the commandments Thou shalt not commit adultery. We don't know. But whatever he wrote, and when, when he says, who was, was without sin, let him cast the first stone. They all walked away. They all walked away. And morals were loose, all but gone. Great wickedness and apathy prevailed throughout the land. And yet here's a man. And the Bible says, in that day, he was just. And he was devout. He was holy. And he was honest. I want to tell you in this song, we see a man characterized by purity. And I tell you, the, the, the child of God, if we're living right with God and we're living holy and honest lives before the Lord, then we have a song. We have something to sing about. Not only was his life characterized by purity in this song, but his life was characterized by patience. Look what it says in verse 25. It says he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for the hope of Israel. He was waiting for the comfort that the Lord would bring to Israel. And here's a man. And remember this. <clears throat> there were hundreds of years had passed. Over 600 years had passed from the time that Isaiah said about a virgin shall bring forth a son. His name will be called Emmanuel, God manifest in the flesh. I want to tell you that from the book of Genesis, when the first promise was ever given, and the Jews understood that promise in Genesis 3, 15, they understood that that was the first promise in the Bible, in the word of God concerning Messiah. And to this day, Jews still believe that he will come. And he is promised in Genesis 3 and 15. And they believe it. So they have waited for thousands of years, for the consolation of Israel. And many of them were tired waiting. 
Many of them had give up looking. But yet here, we find a man and he's characterized by purity and characterized by patience. He's waiting for the coming of the Lord. And you know, there are many today and they have no time for the Lord. And there are many Christians and they live their lives as if the Lord's never coming back again. And in their time, in their generation, they don't have patience. That is, they don't possess their souls. They run here, there, and yonder, and they do this, that, and the other. And they're not patient. They're not waiting for the coming of the Lord, the consolation of the nations, the appearing the second time of Christ. Simeon was among those who, with great expectation, were waiting for the coming of Messiah, the comfort or the consolation of Israel. Thousands of years had passed and still there was little or no sign on the horizon of the Messiah. No sign. Oh, there are some who came claiming to be Messiah. That only hope deferred makes the heart sick. And they were sickened by these imposters. And if someone else rose up, as did the case Whenever one of the religious leaders says, if this work is of God, then it'll prosper. If it's, not, leave, if it's not, then it'll fail. He just didn't care for these things. But I want to tell you, there were those who waited and possessed their souls and lived right before God in the light of his first coming. And I told you it was a mirror image for the church at the second coming. Those who are pure, and those who are patient, those who are anticipating the end of the age and the second coming of Christ. The Lord even said that himself, will, when the Son of Man shall come, will he find faith on the earth? And I'm sure we could interpret that and translate that as, will we find people faithful on the earth? Will there be a generation on the earth like Simeon, anticipating the second coming of Christ. Sure, they mock us. They laugh at us. And they mock the sign there in Moira that has been painted for decades. The coming of the Lord draweth nigh. They laugh at it. <laughs> we're, and even Peter says in the last days there will be scoffers and mockers. And they'll say, where is the hope of his coming? Where is it? We don't see any sign on the horizon. We don't see the stars moving and the sun changing. Ah, we don't see it at all. There's no sign on the horizon. Ah, but if you had eyes to see, you would see. It's there. The signs of the times are there. We're in the last days. The Lord's coming. And we've got to be like Simeon. Characterized by purity. Characterized by patience. And I tell you, I'm not labor the point for time is almost gone. But notice, thirdly, and I'm skipping over a few notes here, a couple of pages uh, I want you to notice not only characterized by purity and patience, but notice his life was characterized by power. Look what it says in verse 25. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. Do you see that? There's a characteristic in this song of Simeon. A characteristic, his life was characterized by power. And those who waited for the consolation of Israel, along with those who looked for the second coming of Christ, are characterized by the infilling of the Spirit. And it's a remarkable thing. I'm not going to preach it to you, but I'll show it to you in Scripture. <clears throat> the, light, the marks of a, a man or a woman filled with the Holy Ghost. Notice in verse 25, if you're filled with the Spirit, then you'll be holy. If you're filled with the Spirit, you'll be devout. That is, you'll be honest. If you're filled with the Spirit, you'll be waiting for the second coming of Christ. And then notice in verse 26, a Spirit-filled man, it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost, he will know the mind and will of God. I tell you, I could preach on the filling of the Spirit in a series in this. I could preach a series on this. The marks of a man filled with the Holy Ghost, it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And look what it says in verse 27. A man or a woman filled with the Holy Ghost and he came by the Spirit, verse 27, into the temple. Do you see that? A man filled with the Spirit, a woman filled with the Spirit will be in the house of God. They'll not be at home. They'll not be unless they have a reason to be there. They'll be in the house of God. And then notice what it says there in verse 28. And then it says, Then took he him up in his arms. He lifted up Christ. This man came into the house of God and he lifted up the Savior. I want to tell you, that's a mark of a spirit-filled man or woman. They don't promote themselves. They don't lift up their gifts or talents. They lift him up 
and they glorify God and they honor Christ. Notice as well it says there, in verse 29, they're characterized by peace. Let now, let us thou thy servant depart in peace. And they believe the word of God, verse 29, according to thy word. And they see Christ. Look at verse 30. My eyes have seen thy salvation. And then verse 33. Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. You see, they, spoke, they speak of Christ. It's a wonderful thing to have the infilling of the Spirit. And I told you the characteristics of a spirit-filled man or woman are found here in the life of Simeon. Let's be like Simeon. And let's seek cleansing through the blood of the vessel and the infilling of the spirit. Finally, notice his life was characterized by proclamation. Look what it says. He took him up in his arms in verses 28, 32. And blessed God and said, Lord, that's the nook menace. This is the song. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace. According to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast preferred before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. You know, his song proclaimed Christ as one who satisfies. He says, peace, let me depart in peace. It's a wonderful way to die, to die at peace with God. It's a wonderful way to die. Here's Simeon. And he says, Lord, let me now die. Wow. Let me die in peace. It's a beautiful, beautiful sentiment. Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace. It's a beautiful way to die. It's the only person in the world can die like that is the believer. At peace with God. And he spoke of Christ as one that satisfies. I'm at peace. Christ is everything to me. And he sung of Christ as one who saves, uh, because he says, mine eyes have seen thy salvation. And he sp- sung of Christ as one who is a sign. Uh, verse 34 says, it'll be a sign that will be spoken against. And it's true. Christ is a watershed in this world. He's what divides in your home between saved and lost. He's what divides in the workplace. Christ is the watershed. He is the great divide. The one who separates Husband and wife, mother and father, child and parent, grandparents and grandchildren. Christ is the watershed, and he's spoken of as a sign. And you're either for Christ or against Christ. And I want to tell you, he's set for the rise and fall of many. You will either rise to the heights of glory and heaven, or fall upon that stone the builders reject, into the depths of despair and hell. Christ is set as a sign, as a watershed, as one who is divisive, who has come not just to give men peace but a sword to divide the nations. Those who accept him will rise. Those who reject him will fall. Set for the rise and fall of many in Israel. And furthermore, Christ has spoken of one who is a sword. The sword pierced the heart of Mary. The sword pierced the heart of every believer. We consider what Christ suffered, bled, and died. His entire song was about Christ. And I trust, like Simeon, that we will say today in that great Christmas hymn, O come, let us adore him. That's by in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we thank thee and praise thee today for thy presence, for the love of God, the mercies of the Lord. We thank thee for our Savior. We bless thee, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God for coming into this world and dying in our guilty room instead. We thank thee for suffering. We thank thee for thine agony. We bless thee, Lord, that you have saved us with an everlasting salvation. You've given us peace with God, the joy of sins forgiven. The guilt is removed. The stain of our sin, the stench of it is gone. It's been paid for at the cross. And we rejoice in the hour and the day that we, like Simeon, saw thy salvation. We thank thee we can depart this scene of time in peace, knowing it is well with our soul. And therefore we do have a right to rejoice today, to be glad in the Lord, to be thankful, Lord, to be a people that are praising. And we pray, Lord, we'll not lose our joy. 
We'll not lose our song. Lord, let us not return again to the world's song. Let the world not be the source and theme of our happiness. Grant that we might find our joy in Christ and in Christ alone. That he'll give us a reason to be joyful. He will give us a reason to praise and to be happy. And we pray you'll gladden our hearts today as we think of the coming of Christ, as we think of his birth at Bethlehem, as we think of what he came to do to die for us on Calvary and to rise from the dead and to give us peace with God and eternal life. Lord, we love thee and we worship thee and we sing unto thee and we praise thee and we extol and magnify thee today. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the God of all creation, the God of revelation, and the God of our salvation, we worship thee. Bless thy people today. Save those that are unsaved. Restore backsliders. Give help today. We offer prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen.